projects. So you can see poster presentations with our research at Conway Center as part of that as well. Um, keynote address for today, Catherine Kajewski from the Philadelphia Mayor's Office of Sustainability. We'll be talking about sustainability initiatives in Philadelphia. That's at 4.30 in Cinema, I believe. Uh, yes, that's right. So 4.30 in the Cinema. Um, and also for the students, there is a um, documentary film showing uh, of um, uh, Planet Earth and John Barry uh, this evening. So check that out as well. Um, so this morning, uh, we thought we would start off with a panel discussion about natural gas extraction in the Marcellus Shale. So you know, as we think about Earth Day and some of the environmental um, issues that, that are on our minds right now, um, some things that probably come to mind are climate change, um, fossil fuels, uh, so the energy economy, air pollution, water pollution, and these are all issues that that uh, natural gas extraction intersects with. And so uh, this is something I think that's, that's very timely for um, consideration on, on Earth Day. Um, and when we, when we think about natural gas extraction, the Marcellus Shale is also a very local and immediate issue. This is something that's happening in Pennsylvania, uh, and other states as well, but, but fairly um, intensively at the moment in Pennsylvania. Um, and it's happening right now, so you know, it's something that's, that's local, something that's very relevant for, for our lives. Um, and what we thought we would do today is, is have uh, invite uh, some experts, uh, people who are working on natural gas extraction uh, issues uh, to have a short presentation and then discussion and, and question and answer period with you. Um, so we, what we're going to do is, is do maybe five minutes of presentations from each one of the, the invited panelists, but then um, have the rest of the time devoted to discussion and questions and answers. Um, so I, I hope you've uh, um, brought some, some thoughts about natural gas extraction with you so that we can address them. Um, and really, this is a, um, a discussion of both the, the potential benefits and the potential risks. Um, and I do want to note that um, we, you know, at, on a uh, academic campus um, on Earth Day, perhaps that's what kept them away. But I did invite um, some members of the industry, Marcellus Shell Coalition. We also reached out to the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, the, the PA Department of Environmental Protection, to try and join us. Um, and hopefully, here we will be an objective. An objective panel, um, but I just did want to let you know we also did reach out to industry about success. So, um, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, I'm going to introduce each each of the panelists. They'll give a short presentation, um, and then and then really what we'll do is open it up after that. So we're going to start uh, with Steve Goldsmith. Dr. Goldsmith is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography and Environment here at Villanova. Um, he is a uh, environmental geologist by by background. Um, Dr. Goldsmith got his PhD from Ohio State University. Um, and his research is focused on, on watersheds, trying to understand um, carbon cycling, and, and a recent interest now is natural gas extraction activities in, in watersheds, um, how human activities are, are, are uh, interplaying with watershed um, uh, environmental geology. He's published in um, such journals as uh, Nature Climate Change, Geochemical Cosmic Nature Acta, uh, and Geology. Um, and I've as the, as, as the geologist of the bunch to kind of start us off with a little bit of an introduction about what natural gas extraction of Marcellus Shale is and then some of the potential uh, benefits and risks. So. Great, thanks, Nick. So, as Matt mentioned, I'm a geologist. I didn't bring any slides, but I did bring a rock with me today, so I'm <laughs> in the honor of Earth Day. Um, uh, just as, as, as you mentioned, uh, with regards to the Marcellus Shale, it's a very local issue. Uh, we do have this abundant uh, natural resource here in Pennsylvania. Uh, our own Energy Information Administration has estimated there, are, there could be anywhere up to 141 trillion cubic feet of natural gas uh, in the Marcellus. And to put that in simple terms, it basically would be a roughly 14 year supply of the US's natural gas needs. So that is a pretty significant amount. Others have estimated it could be three times that amount. Um, so when we talk about the extraction or environmental issues uh, associated with natural gas, I think it's important to talk about the extraction process itself. And uh, what I would like you to do is, is think of this as the Marcella Shale, uh, located about a mile beneath us. And, and the best example I could use here is think of this sort of as a block of Swiss cheese. And uh, 
if you actually look at the sides of, of that block of Swiss cheese, you would notice that you would see holes in it, right? Um, but if you look closely enough, you would not be able to see all the way through it. So there are pore spaces within that uh, block of cheese, but they're not interconnected. Uh, and you can think of shale sort of in the same way. There's abundant pore spaces, but they're present at a microscopic level. And each of those pore spaces can contain natural gas, but we simply can't just put a pipe in the ground and suck it out. We actually have to do something first. We actually have to break apart that rock to release that natural gas and, and, and bring it back to the surface. Um, so how we do that is a process called hydraulic fracking. And in essence, what we are doing is putting a liquid at high velocity down a well in order to break apart that rock, propagate fractures, and, and release that gas. Um, hydraulic fracturing itself is, is, has been around since around 1950. Um, and traditionally, it's associated with vertical well shafts. So we're actually putting the uh, water at high pressure directly down the well. And when you think about it, we could, we can only break apart the, the shale in the immediate vicinity of that well. So we don't get a great return on our investment. And it's only been in the last 20 um, years or so with the advent and advances in horizontal drilling, we can now bend that well shaft at depth um, and begin to fracture that surface and chase that shale there horizontally. So we actually are capable of fracking the same well multiple times. We get a greater return on our investment and it's actually been a productive process. It, it has substantially lowered our natural gas prices. Um, when we think about the environmental impacts, um, two that we could talk about is both from a water and greenhouse gas perspective. With regards to water, it's an issue of both quantity and quality. Um, when we frack a well, it requires anywhere between two to 10 million gallons of water each time that well is fracked, and the average is roughly about four million gallons. Um, something we often don't talk about is that much of that water remains permanently underground. So we've actually lost water from the surficial cycle. Um, in Pennsylvania, we are lucky, and relatively lucky in the sense that we have relatively abundant surface water. Um, but if this process accelerates, it kind of goes without being said that we could actually have more stress uh, with regards to water stress in our, in our watersheds. Um, with regards to quality of water, we also need to understand um, it's an issue of not only what we are putting down the well, but also what we are getting in return. So um, over 95% of what we put down the well is, is a combination of both water and sand. We actually want to put some sort of abrasive material to help break apart that rock. Um, and less than roughly 0.5% of what we put down that well is, is what we call fracking fluids. And these can range from a variety of chemical substances. Um, we have things such as hydrochloric acid that are used to actually dissolve the rock and it help break apart the, the, the rock itself. Um, we have other items such as ethylene glycol, uh, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylenes, known carcinogens, um, and other issues, uh, other, sorry, other items such as rust inhibitors, uh, which are used to protect the integrity of the well. So with what comes up is the natural gas. In addition to that, we are getting some of these fracking fluids we put down the well. We are also getting in significant quantities what is called brine water. And this is um, ancient seawater that was also trapped in the pore spaces of this rock. So as we break it apart, we are not only getting the gas, but we are also getting that ancient seawater that's been trapped. Um, we simply cannot dispose of that brine water in freshwater systems, so we actually have to do something with it. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, but one last thing that also comes back up with, with this water and something that Nat Weston is interested in is what we call radio, radiogenic material. So this is, um, uranium was actually in place in the shale as well when it was initially formed. It has been decaying over time. And um, a particular uh, substance of interest has been radium-228, which you can actually detect in very noticeable quantities that comes back in this flow back water. Um, with regards to potential pathways for water contamination, um, many of you have probably seen pictures of the surface lined pits. Um, we actually temporarily store the water in these. Um, the idea is that evaporation would lower the quantity of that water and, and reduce your disposal costs. Um, now, if you've seen pictures, you also realize that these are not probably the most integral <laughs> features. Um, they're obviously can be prone to liquid leakage into the subsurface. Um, there's been cases where the, the well casing itself has been shown to leak and impact the, the shallow groundwater table. And then finally, 
Um, there's also been several cases of reported spills associated with the fracking operations themselves and off-site off transport of this waste material. Um, finally, from a greenhouse gas perspective, and I think Jerry's going to put the energy use in, 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 in better context, um, there are some pros to talk about here as well. And, and one, uh, going back to the, the EIA, um, their recent assessment has showed that we have we are on a current downward trajectory in the U.S.'s CO2 emissions, and uh, substantially so in the first quarter of the year. That's the period that ranges from January to March. And this has been largely attributed to the transition from coal, coal fire power plants over to natural gas power plants, as well as for industrial purposes. So natural gas is cleaner burning than coal, and it's, it's actually showed up substantially in, in a reduction in our CO2 emissions. Um, conversely, something that we have not well accounted for is um, actual methane releases from the extraction process itself. And as many of you are aware, methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. And it could turn out in the end, um, when we actually assess this, that we can be negating any potential greenhouse gas benefit we are getting from switching over to a cleaner burning fossil fuel. So. Um, one thing I just want to stress with regards to the environmental impacts, we are very much in the early stages of determining what these actually are. Um, and and um, I think that's a great lead-in for some of you, Bill. Good. Thanks, Steve. Uh, definitely a nice introduction there to, to sort of the, the context of how hydraulic fracturing works and some of the benefits and, and risks of that. Um, so next, Dr. Jerry Mead. Um, to, to sort of expand on, on what Dr. Goldsmith has, has started with and, and talk about some of the um, environmental uh, risks and, um, and, and bring a little bit of the research that he's been doing um, uh, specifically on stream ecosystems um, up in the Marcellus Shell region. Uh, Dr. Mead's an um, assistant research professor at the Department of Biodiversity, Earth, and Environmental Science at Drexel University um, and is part of the uh, uh, recent merger of the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia with Drexel University. And he's part of the, the Patrick Center uh, of uh, Environmental Research at the Academy of Natural Sciences. Uh, Dr. Mead received his PhD at, at SUNY Syracuse, uh, and he's uh, been published uh, in journals such as the American Journal of Botany, <coughs> Journal of Wetlands, and the Journal of uh, Biogeography. So, Dr. Mead, we'll take a look. Ready to roll? Uh, yeah, just turn that. That's a that's a my question. Yeah, sure. uh, my slides. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Will you have to click for me? Sure, I'll stand here and just give it an eyeball. <coughs> okay, so you can advance. I'll just point. Okay, so I'm going to just go through some of the research we've been doing down at the Academy of Natural Sciences at Drexel University. Uh, this started in about 2010. I'm a little bit loud for a microphone, I think. <laughs> So in 2010, I had a, a graduate student do a pilot study on the Marcellus Shale's potential impacts to surface water, small stream ecosystems in the Susquehanna Basin. I'll present that work to you, and then we launched a larger study that built off of that. So the big thing, uh, like Dr. Goldsmith said, is energy is a major issue and it interacts with just about every environmental problem that we have. The first three lines there, this represents the global energy mix. They're all fossil fuels. The world is run by fossil energies. That's how it goes. Things like nuclear, the purple line, uh, hydropower, very small fraction. Next. Uh, those of you who think peak oil, do you Anybody here know as what peak oil is? Peak oil is the point where uh, production of energy starts to decline in terms of oil. And there's peak coal, there's peak natural gas, which we'll see uh, in some time. Many people who doubt that peak oil is an issue and that we're seeing this today, the U.S. peaked on oil production in 1970. Peak oil is not a myth. You see this light purple line here. This is the discoveries of oil fields in the U.S. shifted ahead 30 years. It lines up perfectly with this declining or bell-shaped curve 
of oil production in the U.S. So we have energy issues coming at us uh, right now. Next. The big thing is not so much that we're going to run out of oil and energy to run society, it's how much return we get energy-wise on investment. You look in 1930, that blue dot up there, we get about 100 units of energy back per one invested in getting oil out of the ground. It's declined to about 30. So these cheap fossil energies have huge returns on investment. They allow us to run our economy in ways that are not really possible by lots of alternatives. Shale gas, we've estimated, my student in the Marcellus, is about 60 to 1, which is pretty good. Next. So I think that the, one of the biggest challenges we have conservation-wise, balancing the needs of the economy with the environment, and the environment provides services to people. So this is what I've had held entire meetings focused on this issue. Next. So the pilot study that my graduate student did, I like to joke this is the study where the one-eyed man in the land of the blind is king, because that's what I felt like the the one-eyed man in the land of the blind. Nine little study sites uh, gave me a, a vision on what's happening here in the Northeast on water quality. Just nine sites, three with no mining, three with low densities of mining or intensity, and three with high. And this is in the Dimmick area, so kind of the, one of the be, uh, worst case scenarios. We just measured aquatic insects in the stream is an indicator, basic water quality in terms of conductivity, pH, uh, and we tried to control for everything that could confound our analysis, like standardized for how much force there was in the watershed, and so on. Uh, next. So what we found, water, the conductivity of the water in the high density sites was nearly twice what it was in this upper left hand corner in the sites without mining. So it went from around 100 to 200. Uh, and we found that the diversity of the aquatic insects went down by 50, 60%. You see these here in the, the center column and the right column. But the thing we also noticed was the low density or low intensity mining sites, there was no significant difference between that and watersheds without mining. Next. So what we said, where is there a threshold here? Is there a balance? Is there some risk element that we can take into account and say, if you mine at this level intensity, you're hedging your bets in terms of risk for pollution to the environment versus the trade-off in terms of return on investment from getting energy out of the ground from the shale. Next. So I assessed all the streams in the Susquehanna River Basin with a computer program that I developed. And there's about 300,000 of these 200 meter long sections of stream. And this is our profile of, for small streams, what the density is out there for mining. So as the color goes from black to white, there's more numbers of sections of streams with a certain density of wells in them. The dotted yellow line is where we saw kind of in our pilot study where significant impacts were occurring. So to me, this says, hey, in 2011, mining has not moved to densities at which we should expect much for impacts. And all these, there's few sites above the yellow line that have uh, densities. None of the sites above the yellow line have densities at which we think we'll see impacts to surface water. Next. So we launched this bigger study, uh, looking at diatoms, studying fish, doing some more detailed chemistry. Uh, next. And this is what we found for the public lands. Now it's very different. Public lands are, have a lot more management than private lands, well pad placement and things. The only significant thing we found was there were a signature of chemicals related to frack water in three of our 26 sites. And the diatoms showed significant correlations to uh, well pad density. 
but all the sites in the public lands had densities approaching that lower threshold in our study site. So really there wasn't much uh, impact to the environment in these public lands or state parks at low densities, except for diatoms and a few chemical signatures. Nothing showed up significant for fish, nothing for salamanders. Uh, next. That's it. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks, Jerry. That's uh, <coughs> definitely good to see some uh, some data on this because I think one of the one of the issues as we think about hydraulic fracturing, as Dr. Goldsmith said, it's really we're really in the early stages of trying to understand the impacts, um, and and there's a lot of I think conversation that goes on uh, without a whole lot of of uh, data necessarily behind it. So it's nice to nice to see some data. And I think we'll certainly come back to some of these, um, some of the data that you showed as, as we have a discussion on this. Um, and what we're doing, going to do now is expand a little bit beyond um, purely the, the sort of environmental impacts um, in, 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 in talking to two scientists, um, a geologist and a, and a systems ecologist, and move into um, considering the other sort of broader impacts of this, uh, both positive and, and negative. Um, and, and next in our, on our panel is Dr. Uh, Ruth McDermott-Levy, who is um, part of Villanova <coughs> School of Nursing. Um, she received her, her PhD here at, at Villanova, um, <clears throat> and her area of specialty is in environmental health um, and, and specifically health of, of vulnerable populations. Um, she's been published in uh, uh, art, uh, uh, publications such as Nursing Practice, Public Health Nursing, Pennsylvania Nurse, um, and I do want to note that um, the Pennsylvania State <laughs> Nursing Nurses Association, PSNA, honored uh, Dr. McDermott Levy with its 2011 Nurse as Global Citizens Award. And the quote is, Dr. McDermott Levy is a visionary global nurse educator. In addition to her hands-on health care across the globe, she is passionate about environmental health and leads other nurses in advocating for food and water. So um, clearly some uh, environmental um, overlap there with, with her nursing interests. Um, and, and will you mention the um, uh, call for the moratorium? Yes. Yes, yes then I, I will. I'll leave that to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, OK. So as um, Nat said, that I'm going to look at the health impacts. And, and in public health, um, we look at risk. So that's what I'm talking about is who is at risk and not necessarily these diseases are going to happen. So I, I just want to have that as a disclaimer. What I did is I looked at the um, published scholarly literature of what's going out there related to water, air, and social um, co or community constructs. So as far as, um, if we can go to the next slide, as far as water quality, what that's probably the thing that people hear most about when they hear about health impacts of Marsalis shale or, or fracking. And what we've seen is um, effects of methane migration from, from the well site into um, water. So this happens with people with their private wells. Um, and you may have seen people whose um, water lights on fire, and that's from the methane. Not everybody's water is lighting on fire. But, but what, the, what we are concerned with health with related to methane is, number one, we don't have enough data related to that. And, and, um, when we look at the, the health impacts, what we also want to think about is who is our sample? Because I really don't want to be tested for human impacts of drinking methane. So this is something that um, I'm constantly bringing up when we meet with public health people in the health department of we need to protect people before they get sick. But, um, so, but as you know, methane um, can, is a fuel. So it's not something we, we want to drink. So that's one of the things we're seeing. We also see from spills that were mentioned, um, bromide, which has um, gotten into surface waters, and if it gets into um, municipal waters, when they treat it, um, it, it gets exposed to chlorine, and then that can cause um, fetal problems, so um, problems with um, birth defects and things. So that's our health problem there. And then also issues with um, leaky pits, and as was mentioned, um, it's full of carcinogens. Um, neurotoxicity is a big problem, and we see birth defects and reproductive problems. And then um, the water consumption issue, which is a bigger problem down the road that we really need to think about and be concerned with. But the areas that I 
think that people really need to pay attention to because everybody talks about the water and, and we can in a sense buy our way out of that by you know bring water in but we really can't replace the air we breathe at that time unless we're all going to walk around with gas masks and and when we think about Marsalis shale and and what's going on in, in the communities what we're seeing is essentially an industrialized process going on so it's not just the drilling, but it's the diesel trucks that are coming in, the diesel generators that are running. And so um, in communities where this is occurring, they're seeing an increase in ground level ozone and particulate matter. Ground level ozone is a really um, potent um, pulmonary um, irritant. So we see problems with, um, if somebody already has asthma, we see um, problems with asthma um, exacerbations as well as emphysema, and then um, reduced lung function. As far as particulate matter, this is um, a really big area of concern, and I actually just see I forgot a T, um, is that um, we see problems with asthma, and we also see problems with cardiovascular disease, um, which can lead to hypertension, um, MIs, which is a heart attack, and stroke, so, and also cancer. So particulate matter is a really important um, air quality measure, and as mentioned um, also, the concern with methane, um, on the short run, it does look like um, natural gas is a problem, but with the leaks that are occurring <coughs> along the process, we may have a bigger problem with um, greenhouse gases. The other thing that we're seeing with air quality is we're seeing a whole, um, a, a slew of symptoms from patient, from people in communities. And um, you probably read about this in the newspaper of people who have nosebleeds or headaches or confusion. And um, in the literature, it is finally coming out, the symptoms that are occurring, but we're not really relating it to anything as of yet. But these symptoms really are related to exposure to vol volatile organic compounds that are in the air, namely benzene and toluene. Um, and so that's something that we need to follow. Again, people um, in newspaper reports are having um, elevated benzene levels in their blood. Um, but again, this is something we want to prevent. We don't, you know, this is not a sample we want to test on human beings. So um, we need to really be proactive with this. The other, the next slide, the other areas that we're um, really concerned about as far as community health is the impact on, on um, towns and communities related to the industrialized process that is occurring with um, the workforce moving in and, and um, you know, all the, the trucks that are coming. So we're seeing a change in the lifestyle for communities. And um, that, that might sound like it's no big deal, but people really, they choose to live in rural areas because they want a quiet life. So if you can only imagine, you know, your whole lifestyle disrupted. Um, what we're seeing and, and what is coming out in um, some of the studies is people are complaining of noise, and again, you can say, well, that's no big deal, but there certainly are health impacts of noise. Um, stre chronic stress is a problem, um, and um, also hypertension. Stress cannot be um, dismissed. There's actually, from long-term stress, we can see um, a change in um, a, a gene's response, so um, the way, you know, the genetic expression that, um, we can see problems with, so it's not something that we just want to forget about. We're also seeing problems with housing and people in some areas are homeless um, because of the rising cost of housing. So the, the workforce, the extraction workforce can come into the community and that can actually um, push other people out of housing opportunities. Um, and then you probably have also heard um, that there's been rises in um, uh, sexually transmitted infections, namely chlamydia is um, on the rise. And that relates to um, the occupational risks in our, our workforce. The, the workforce of extraction workforce tends to be um, a young male um, workforce with a, a fairly decent disposable income living in communities that they don't have ties to. So um, we've got you know these young men about 18 to 30 years old and that population tends to participate in risk behaviors. So the communities are seeing an increase in alcohol and drug um, abuse and then also leading to um, motor vehicle injuries and um, workplace injuries. As mentioned, um, the other occupational risk is um, radiation exposures from um, the water, the flow back that's coming back, and not only 
um, from the water that's um, in the pits and the flowback, but also the, there's risk from the, the drilling materials that are down there that come back up that might be, um, have some radiation. And then the other occupational concern, um, and this is also for people who live close to the drilling sites, is the, um, the use of sand and um, the drilling of rocks um, releases cilia, um, which is these fine particles and can cause um, pulmonary disease. So we may not see this um, immediately, but you know, five to 20 years down the road, we can see a workforce or community members with um, pulmonary problems and chronic pulmonary problems. And then this last slide is just to kind of keep in mind um, other populations that are at risk. Um, in the communities, um, women, um, pregnant women and children, they, pregnant women breathe more deeply, so they're at risk for um, uh, air quality issues. Um, children also breathe more rapidly, so again, air quality is a problem. And also, they drink more per, per their body weight, so if we have contaminated water, that's an issue for them. Um, and then the elderly and, and people with chronic diseases have a lower reserve, so that's um, something that we need to be concerned about. And then certainly the extraction workforce, and we don't think about them um, enough, but they're somebody that we need to keep, a group that we need to keep an eye on. And then as far as what's, what health professionals are doing um, related to this, in Pennsylvania last year, um, Act 13, which was the um, gas and oil um, regulations related to um, uh, extraction of natural gas, part of that was what's known in, um, with health professionals is the gag order. And what this order says is that um, health care providers cannot share um, health information related to any exposure. So, and the other piece of that is that they, the chemicals are um, considered proprietary, and so it's more difficult to find out what is the actual recipe or solution that each um, company is using. So, if there is an exposure um, and it's not readily available, the healthcare provider needs to contact the, the company to find out what it is, and then they can't share that information. They can share it with the patient, but they can't share it with other healthcare providers. The problem with that is we, we rely on case by case to learn how to treat things. So if we're not able to look at that whole thing, we're not learning from each patient situation, and we do all the time. And so we can't provide the quality of care that we need to for people. And um, as was requested, our, um, our uh, professional organizations have called for moratoriums on um, new well drilling. And um, the American Nurses Association this summer um, call, have, uh, has a resolution um, requesting that there um, is a moratorium on new wells, as well as the American Public Health Association and the American Medical Association's residents and fellows group have also asked for a moratorium. So we're working, we're trying. And you largely led the effort with the AMA, is that right? Yes. Yes, Pennsylvania State Nurses Association, and I was an author. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, um, you know, clearly, we've heard about some environmental risks and benefits, and and, and Dr. McDermott, let me touch on you know this is impacting people's health, both residents and workers. Uh, as Dr. Goldsmith said, there's there's a lot of natural gas down there, so there's huge economic pressures. This is clearly an issue that's that's becoming increasingly important. Um, and, and something now we need to consider is, is the policy framework in which we're considering uh, this natural gas extraction in Marcellus Shale. So uh, we've asked Joe Nye to join us. From, he's the uh, uh, program director for the um, uh, Clean Water Action in, in East Pennsylvania. Uh, so I guess you're technically East Pennsylvania program organizer for Clean Water Action. Uh, he's got a degree from Temple University. Um, he's worked on uh, con congressional campaigns as a field organizer. And, uh, and has worked on other environmental initiatives such as campaigning to reduce mercury emissions in Pennsylvania. Um, and I believe mean, a good chunk of your time now is, is dealing directly with uh, natural gas extraction. Sure. Yeah. So, um, we've asked uh, Joe here to talk, uh, among other things, uh, specifically about the, the policy um, outline that, that we're dealing with this natural gas extraction. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Weston. Um, while while many of the environmental impacts may be sort of up for debate, the, the political impacts of natural gas extraction in Pennsylvania are pretty clear. Um, so, like I said, my name is Joe Nye. I, I work for Clean Water Action. 
Clean Water Action is a citizens organization, so we work to advocate for public health and environmental issues. Uh, we are completely citizen funded, so we, we go door to door in your community. You may have had us knock on your door recently um, to, to raise funds to support our organization and the work that we do. But we, we're, we're a voice for public health, um, and we believe that we represent a lot of pop popular opinion that's out there. So. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the policy that's going on in Pennsylvania right now. Um, Act 13 is, is sort of the big um, focal point that we can look to that sort of guides exactly where the politics of fracking are in Pennsylvania right now. Act 13 was passed a little over a year ago on Valentine's Day, uh, which was a horrible Valentine's Day gift to all of us here in Pennsylvania. Um, it was passed largely along a party line vote. Um, virtually most Republicans in the state, uh, I think all Republicans in the state voted for it and most Democrats voted against it. So it was very much a split issue along party lines. Um, and since there were many par parts of Act 13 that were, in our opinion, very bad for the environment, but there are also many parts of Act 13 that were left out, uh, things that could have been done that would have been really great, uh, but the, that were sort of ignored and, and left aside for, for future debate. So I just want to go over a couple of those. One of the biggest things that you'll hear about about Act 13, and it's still currently being debated at the Supreme Court level here in Pennsylvania, is that one of the things that oil companies really wanted to be able to do with the passage of Act 13 was ensure that they could cut through the red tape and regulations as much as possible and make drilling as quick and as simple as possible. So there were hundreds of local ordinances in Pennsylvania that, that municipalities, um, townships, boroughs, things like that had passed to control natural gas extraction in their areas. And what Act 13 actually did was it, there was a provision in Act 13 that removed all municipal zoning rights from the state, from municipalities in the state of Pennsylvania to determine where wells can be fracked. Um, so this is a really big deal. That means that, you know, if you have a residential zone in your neighborhood, it's not necessarily up to the municipality as to whether or not a well can be fracked there. And the municipality may not have wanted it, but now that's at the state level to be determined. Um, so Commonwealth Court, a couple of municipalities really didn't like the idea of this, and um, a, a few organizations as well. And so they, they sued the state of Pennsylvania um, to throw out this provision of Act 13, and Commonwealth Court agreed with those municipalities that this was a completely unconstitutional component of the law. And as a result, the, it's currently being appealed by the state in the Supreme Court, um, and we're waiting to see exactly how that comes down. Um, another thing that was left out of Act 13 was the opportunity for a real tax on gas drilling. So here in Pennsylvania, we've had a huge amount of cuts to our Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and we have plenty of budget issues here in Pennsylvania that go well beyond the environment. And the, the Department of Environmental T Protection has been cut to like a third of the size that it was when Tom Ridge was governor. Um, and that's you know saying a lot. And that's both Democrats and Republicans' fault. I mean, Ed Rendell cut the, the Department of Environmental Protection budget. Tom Corbett has cut the Department of Environmental Protection budget. Um, and so this was, you know, with all this extra money coming in from a new industry, this was a real opportunity to solve some of our long-term budget problems and short-term budget problems. Um, but the, the people who voted for Act 13, the, many of the Republicans who voted for it, didn't feel that including a tax on gas extraction was appropriate. Um, and instead, there's something called an impact fee, which really, if, if you compare it to other, if you, if you were to think of it as a tax, um, it's really, really small compared to other states where gas drilling occurs. The, the impact, the, the equivalent in Texas is about three times as much, and West Virginia is about twice as much. So we, we really missed a big opportunity with Act 13 to, to do some real budget work. Um, if gas drilling it had to happen, this was a real opportunity to, to help us out as a state, and, and we missed it. Uh, there also are, in our opinion, certainly inadequate environmental protections in Act 13. Um, many of the people who voted for Act 13 will tell you that Act 13 actually increased and, and strengthened environmental regulations in the state, and that's really a half-truth. Um, there, there are increases in things like the setbacks from public and private water sources in terms of how where a well can be dug, but those increases are, are not adequate compared to some scientific studies that have been done, um, one by Duke University specifically, that shows that up to 3,000 feet, um, it can, or that brine solution can travel up to 3,000 feet um, and, and that the, the setbacks are only 500 to 1,000 feet, depending on whether it's a public or private water source. That's just an example of how the environmental regulation component of it isn't nearly as strong as many people who voted for it would like you to think. Um, and we also have absolutely no acknowledgement in uh, Act 13 that talks about open air frack pits, these, these open pits that just have um, 
fracking fluid and toxic chemicals sitting in them. Some of them are very volatile that can just evaporate into the atmosphere um, and, and they leak. I mean, really all a frack pit is is a hole that's dug in the ground that's lined with a tarp and you pour the fluid into there and, and you know, that can leak pretty easily, especially if the tarp rips. And sometimes the tarps are even buried in the ground after you take the fluid out. Um, and there's no regulation of, about that at all in our state. So once again, another big opportunity that was missed to protect the environment with Act 13. So another big political impact that's going on right now in Pennsylvania is you have massive, massive campaign contributions, political campaign contributions to elected officials who are running for office in our state. Um, you know, a, a large, large amount of that money went to Governor Corbett's campaign in 2010 and continues, he continues to raise money from the oil and gas industry. To date, I believe he's raised $1.65 million from oil and gas. And, and here in Pennsylvania, we don't have campaign contribution limits. So you can donate as much as you are able to any political candidate. At the federal level, like if somebody's running for Congress, you can only give them up to a certain amount. But here in our state, you can give candidates as much as you would like. So that is really opens the door for oil and gas to have a big impact on what politicians do. And that's something Clean Water Action is incredibly concerned about when you have special interests completely controlling um, the political will in the state. I mean, it's, it's hard to vote against an oil and gas bill when you took, you know, four or five or six figures from them for your political campaign. Um, so that's something that we see as a big issue. Currently, the, the Department of Environmental Protection um, is not doing such a great job either. The secretary, um, who's the head of the Department of Environmental Protection, is Michael Kranzer, uh, or it was, he, he actually resigned last week on Monday um, to go and work for a law firm that does um, they, they do lobbying and they represent oil and gas interests. Uh, and that's what our Secretary of Environmental Protection, or, or Department of Environmental Protection, has decided to go on and do with his career. So it's not, there's, you know, you can use your own judgment to decide what he was really doing and who he was really talking to while he was at the helm at DEP. Um, but he's gone now. So now we have a, a part-time interim person running DEP. Uh, his name's Chris Abruzzo. Chris Abruzzo has absolutely no environmental experience of any kind on his resume. Uh, he has never done environmental work before. He's an attorney whose practice has mostly been, um, you know, public work working on drug cases. So, and, and he's only working part-time as head of DEP. So we're sort of without a leader at the moment um, in, in terms of environmental protection, not that we had a great one previously. Uh, but, but that's where we are in terms of our Department of Environmental Protection. That's, that's certainly concerning. The industry is supposed, to, the gas industry is supposed to be regulated by the Department of Environmental Protection and with consistent budget cuts to the department and a, a no secretary at the moment or a secretary who has connections to the oil and gas industry, you can imagine why we have some political issues with oil and gas here in the state. And Clean Water Action is actually currently engaged in a campaign with the Department of Environmental Protection to get them to fully disclose water testing results. Um, so th there's a big issue going on right now that the Department of Environmental Protection actually knowingly withholds water testing results from the public. I could go into more detail about that if I had more time. Uh, but essentially, the EPA, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, requires that a certain number of heavy metals be tested for when there's fracking contamination suspected. Uh, it's 24 and the Department of Environmental Protection uses a code sometimes that only returns results for eight, even though all 24 were tested for, regardless of whether the, the other 16 are hazardous or not. So we're working to get the department to acknowledge those issues and, and explain why they do that, because as of yet, they have issued no public explanation as to why they would withhold water testing results from the public. And so uh, you know, I'll leave it there. Obviously, I could talk about this for a long time, but I'm happy to answer any questions when we get there. Good. Thanks. I suspect some of our questions will very much be on, on uh, policy issues. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so to wrap up uh, the panel, I've invited uh, Susan Phillips. Um, she is a energy reporter uh, with State Impact PA, which is a partnership with National Public Radio um, and WHYY and WITF uh, radio stations. Um, and, and you're based mostly out of WHYY? I am, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and, and so Susan could, I think, probably address any, any and all of, of these issues because she's been uh, spending a good amount of her time with State Impact PA doing reporting on, on uh, Marcellus Shale uh, uh, gas activities. Um, and, and, um, and it, but I've invited her here, you know, as we've heard, this is an issue that is 
economically important, and it is really impacting people's lives, um, specifically the, the, the workers and the residents up in the regions where natural gas extraction is, is happening. And so um, Susan has, has interviewed them um, and, and really knows um, so on the ground uh, what some of these impacts are, both, both positive and, and negative. Um, and so that's what I've, I've asked her to, to uh, talk about. Um, I do want to mention that um, uh, the, the, the state impact PA um, just won a, or just um, yeah, fairly recently, yeah, I guess it's 2013, so just won a very prestigious prize, the uh, DuPont Columbia Prize. Um, and this is basically the broadcast uh, uh, equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize. So this is a, a, a fairly uh, big honor for state impact PA, which is really the, the fruits of Susan's and, and your colleague, uh, Scott Detrow, um, and, and there's uh, somebody new now on the State Impact PA. Yeah, Marie, Marie Cusick, she just started. Yes, okay, I couldn't, couldn't look at it. So uh, that's it really largely because of Susan's work, and it's, uh, it's quite an honor to receive that DuPont Columbia Prize. Um, and so we've asked her here to talk um, about any and all of these issues, but specifically some of the specific stories of, uh, again, both positive and negative, of people um, who have been impacted by Marcella Shale's bill. Um, and do you want to just go ahead and play the clip, or do you want yeah, to Yeah, I'll just introduce it, and you sure. can hit play. Um, so, um, I've done stories about everything that was just talked about here, um, but one of the things um, I think that Nat wanted me to add to it was the fact, you know, what what happens to people out in gas fields, what, what's going on out in gas fields. And obviously there's a lot of people, um, you know, who've benefited economically, you know, lots of, McAvoy. hold on, um, <laughs> impoverished <laughs> people who, who are now, you know, less impoverished, but also um, other folks who haven't benefited from leasing their land, um, and I kept hearing stories about people who had to move or whose, you know, water was ruined in some way, um, and you hear these stories over and over again, it, it, it's all over the state, so there's not some vast conspiracy of, of trial lawyers as far as I'm concerned. But um, what typically happens and what I've been told is, you know, even before fracking happens, um, gas drilling itself will impact their water in some way. So somebody turns on their tap and it doesn't necessarily light on fire, but it's muddy and it's black and then it turns muddy again and maybe it turns orange turns black again, or maybe the well runs dry. Um, and they call DEP, and DEP comes out, and inevitably DEP says, so oh, sorry, there's nothing wrong with your water, or gas drilling hasn't ruined your water, but DEP doesn't tell them what did ruin their water. Um, and so what, a lot of, what happens a lot is um, without water, your house is worthless. Um, so a lot of these folks have had to move and, and just sort of walk away from their mortgages. And so we're going to go to a young woman in Butler County. Um, uh, her name uh, is Kim McAvoy, and she and her fiance and her little girl live in this uh, neighborhood called the Woodlands, um, where a number of people have been impacted by gas drilling. Um, a number of people haven't been impacted by gas drilling. So this is sort of the randomness um, of, of what happens underground <coughs> to water <laughs> when, when gas drilling um, comes in. And it is a very industrial process. Um, and it's sort of mysterious. No one seems to give anyone any answers, whether it's DEP or, you know, uh, there's really nowhere for them to turn. So this is a story of one woman um, who, um, basically had to move out of her house, and so you can, you can play it now. This is in Butler County. She lives with her three-year-old daughter, Skylar, and her fiance in a small, one-story, three-bedroom house at the end of a dirt road in Butler County. Along with a swing set, a collection of toys, and a doghouse, a for sale sign sits on her front yard. A large black dog is tied up near a tree, and the smaller dog chases a bunny around the living room.
because we have black water. About a year ago, McAvoy's water began to look gray and cloudy. Then it turned black. She called a company that drills water wells in the area. A man told her to call the gas company that was drilling nearby. Before that phone call, McAvoy didn't really know much about the gas drilling happening in her rural community. She doesn't own a big piece of land, so the gas companies never asked her to lease her mineral rights. But she was hopeful they would help with the water. The gas company did come out and test in April. And I'm like, great, I'm going to find out why my water is this grayish color. But the company didn't send her the test results until July. And even then, a list of chemicals didn't really explain much. In the meantime, Rex Energy did provide her with clean water that she could use to shower and clean. That ended in January, after the Department of Environmental Protection concluded that Rex Energy's drilling did not contaminate McAvoy's water supply, nor the well water of other families who live in an area of Conequanessing Township called the Woodlands. And yet, to make matters worse, McAvoy's <coughs> well is now running dry, and so is her patients. When she talks about water, McAvoy sounds like a woman who might live in Haiti or Sub-Saharan Africa, but not Butler County, Pennsylvania. It's terrible. It, it is what you focus on every day. When you wake up in the morning, where am I getting a shower? Oh, I gotta do laundry. It's, it's on your mind from morning till night. Water, water, water. There's no opening your tap and you got water to brush your teeth. That does not exist here. To brush your teeth, McAvoy pours bottled tap water that her fiance brings home from work. She collects rainwater in a barrel set up in her backyard. The ones with the red X's are the ones that we fill up outside with the um, outside barrel. So those are just toilet only. But the black ones or the blue ones, those you can use to wash your hands because they're public water. You know, there's nothing funny about it. And you can use it to flush the toilet, too. Yeah, and we keep this, too. McAvoy now has to take her clothes to the laundromat. Her bathtub is full of water jugs to shower and bathe her three-year-old daughter. McAvoy walks half a mile to a friend's hunting cabin, pulling Skylar in a wagon. So yeah, I have to leave because I, we just can't live like this anymore. This gets old really fast, hauling water. Today, Kim McAvoy lets her tap run to show what her water looks like. As it fills a jug, it turns brown and cloudy. The DEP told Kim that nothing is wrong with her water and that the issues are aesthetic. I don't really know. I just know that something happened. Something happened here when they came in Drills got put in the ground, now I have this funny water. A DEP spokesman confirmed that their investigation of McAvoy's water found no link to nearby gas drilling in Conconessing Township. Now, McAvoy is looking to sell her one-story, three-bedroom house, but it's listed for less than what she owes on it. Her realtor, Steve Warren, doesn't have much hope. If it had public water today, I could probably sell for about 120. Right now, with no water, we got it listed at, I think it's 87.9. It's not going to sell because other houses in the area with no water are selling between fifteen and $34,000. But Warren says houses with public water are rising in value because the residents want a secure water source. He says McAvoy could put in a $15,000 cistern and pay up to $400 a month to fill it. But McAvoy says she can't afford that. That's a lot of money. This isn't a mansion that I live in here. This isn't a four hundred, three hundred, three or four hundred thousand dollar home here. McAvoy's muddy water has left her underwater financially. So if she does move without selling her house and stops paying her mortgage, she could face foreclosure. I would rather have bad credit than be dying because my water is so bad. You know, it's like a life or death situation. You either stay and have good credit and keep paying your house payment, or you, you have bad credit and you, you live. It's, it's, it's crazy, you gotta choose. Credit or water, I'm choosing water. So what's it gonna be like packing up and moving out of here? Oh, I'm gonna cry, I already know that. I, I, sometimes I cry just thinking about it. But it, it has to be done. I keep telling myself it's for safety reasons. And McAvoy's not alone. Rex Energy stopped deliveries to 10 families in the area in March. 
She's never before been politically active. But on the day I visit, she and her new friend, Janet McIntyre, are preparing to speak at a rally. Both are nervous. Kim, you put the wagon in? Yeah. Wagon's in, car seat loaded. Look at you. Janet and Kim met after learning they both had water issues. But Janet McIntyre says she can't move. It's the only way. I really can't do anything. I'm stuck. That, that's how I feel right now. I'm stuck. At a rally in nearby Butler City, about 75 people gathered to donate water to families like the McAvoys and the McIntyres. It's McAvoy's first time speaking to such a crowd. Here's what we need to do as Americans. We need to stand up for our freedoms because this is America. It's about the people. It's we the people, not we the corporation. No, we the as they rely on water donated by churches, McIntyre and McAvoy are trying to convince the local township to pipe in water. But the cost could run in the millions of dollars. In Butler County, I'm Susan Phillips for State Impact, Pennsylvania. So that's just one example. <laughs> I've talked to a lot of people in that situation. Um, and it's important to note that Kim and her daughter and her fiance, they have not had any health impacts. Um, I've done lots of stories on people who have um, and feel like the health impacts are related to gas drilling. But again, it's, it's just really hard um, because a lot of things can contribute to health impacts. Um, there's a lot of environmental factors or genetic factors that can make, make people get sick. But um, one thing that is definitely happening it, it, scattered throughout the state are you know, people like Kim who, who are really on the losing end of this deal. Great, thanks Susan. And, and um, if you just Google State Impact PA, there's a, a, all or at least a, a, a lot of stories um, in the series on there, definitely worth, worth checking out. So definitely like to thank all of, uh, of the panelists for the presentation. And what I'd like to do now for, uh, for uh, perhaps maybe about half an hour is, is open this up for, for questions um, and, and what, what have you heard about that you want to know more about? Um, what are some things that maybe you didn't hear about that, um, that you have uh, questions about? And you can address it to the, to the whole panel, to specific panelists. Um, yes. I have a comment and a question. Um, I'm sorry, I, I did arrive a little late. I was dropping off my car, biked over here, and I probably missed about the first two or three panelists. Um, and my comment, I guess, is I've been volunteering and working with Food and Water Watch to collect signatures on a petition to ban fracking. Is that something it's okay if uh, I put out if people are interested in signing the petition? Sure. Yeah. Um, and so my question alongside that is what, what kind of things were talked about in terms of what are some actions that people can take um, when in concern over this? I mean, I saw a lecture recently um, by uh, professor at Swarthmore, Dan, um, Carr Everbach, he's talking about this as kind of being the Wild West phase of development. And there's this new technology and they're just going kind of Wild West into it without really stopping to consider the consequences and the need for a moratorium. I guess one last thing I'll say um, is there is legislation, it was just talked about, um, for it, legislation in the pipeline for a moratorium. Um, and so, in part, uh, the petition, I think, is a good way to um, kind of push for a moratorium. It's a petition for a ban on fracking, but I kind of think of it as like, if you go to buy a vase and they're asking, you know, you only want to spend $50, you're not going to ask for the vase for $50, you're going to start at 25 It's part, part of negotiating. So I kind of think of the asking for a ban on fracking as a negotiating tactic, if you push for the ban. So, um, I'll have that back here. But, so I guess actions, I'm curious about what type of actions. Uh, sure, so, you know, in terms of taking actions, um, you know, I, I would say that the biggest opportunity that you have to take action is the elections. Um, we, we, you know, the fact that Act 13 was passed is directly a result of specific legislators voting for Act 13. Um, Clean Water Action put out a scorecard 
on exactly how all legislators in the state, um, both uh, members of the General Assembly, which is the State House and the State Senate, uh, how they voted both on the final passage of Act 13 and in the, the lead up to the final passage of Act 13. There were a lot of amendment votes um, and, and sort of procedural votes that we gave either a pro-environment or an anti-environment rating to each of the votes and everybody got a score. So um, that's up on our website. It's uh, on cleanwateraction.org um, uh, slash PA. And, you know, in 2014, we're, we have a governor's race in this state. We have, you know, every single member of this General Assembly is up for re-election. And, uh, you know, half of the Senate is up for re-election. So we have a real opportunity to look at the voting records of people who are in office. And, you know, if, if you have the right people in office, you don't have to worry about things like Act 13 passing. So, you know, we're, we're a nonpartisan organization. We're, we're happy to endorse on either side of the aisle. This is actually, uh, this election cycle was the first time in Pennsylvania that we have not endorsed any Republicans. And that's because they all voted for Act 13. So we didn't feel in good conscience that we could endorse anybody who had voted for that law. Um, especially people who we had endorsed in the past and specifically <coughs> told them that we didn't want them to vote for this, that our members didn't want them to vote for this. So uh, take, take a look at people's voting records and, and make sure that you vote. And, and I can just add, we don't need to wait for the elections either. No. I call our legislators at least every two weeks and let them know what I'm thinking, um, whether they like it or not, because that's, that's really going to decide if they get reelected. So let them know before we get rid of them. So maybe they can turn it around. I'm a voter waitress with the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania, and the Southeast elected officials are very important in this Marcella Shale legislation, and I agree with what our expert just said about calling your legislators, but it's not enough for you to talk to just your legislators. You have to talk to your mothers and fathers, your grandmothers, your grandfathers, your cousins. I was speaking with a legislator who was retired from the Harrisburg yesterday, and she said, big money moves in when the void exists and the legislators are not hearing from their constituents. The money is not going to elect those politicians. You, the voters, will be electing them. You are the ones who have to let them know every week, every two weeks. Adopt your legislator. If you're their constituent, let them know. Let your parents know they need to be calling them. Give them some talking points. Call them, not every day, but every other week. Let them know there's the stuff in Harrisburg going on right now. They're, tomorrow, they're going to be reviewing a technical advisory board on the regulations for Chapter 78 that regulate oil and gas. There are some things in there you should be alarmed about. There are some things you should be calling those people about today because of what they're going to be doing tomorrow. I hope some of these people here will be going on May 7th to Arlington, Virginia, where the EPA study on the impact of hydraulic fracturing on water resources is going to be held with the Science Advisory Board review. It's important that they hear from people like Susan, who knows what the impact is on people. It's important they hear from nurses, healthcare professionals. This is everybody's job. It's not just these five people up here or the six people in the environmental class. And I tell my nursing students, they have to be nice to you. I mean, really, if you're having a bad day, they're nice to you when you call the legislators, like, because you're a vote. So it's, you know, you've done something for the day. I, I guess I want to inject some reality in this thing. Leases have been taken up. Industry has moved. I've met with a lot of these managers who are working in the Susquehanna Basin. And really to change what is in motion for much of at least public lands, it's pretty tough to do. So I asked this question myself, what can you do? So I'm interested to hear these results, knowing how much of this stuff is already locked up into play. I will leave out our legal women voters cards. We have a lot of resources online, but I think what we can do, we're not going to take away someone's lease. What we can do, however, is push for stronger regulation, stronger enforcement, stronger penalties. We need to press for a stronger wall between industry and regulators so that ethical concerns don't get in the way, so that we are in fact protecting people. 
who are polluting from pollution. So that there are things we can do, but it's going to take all of us to do it. I'm going to be gone before most of these impacts are felt. But you and your children are the ones who we really are concerned about. Yeah, just to touch on that, I think you hit an important point <laughs> is that we can do this in a much more, I guess, just judicial, way. Yeah, smart, much more smarter way. And, and I think a couple things that were brought up today is one, Jerry has some promising data with regards to decreasing the well pad density. Joe talked about um, having offset, a minimum offset from a, a water supply. Now, obviously that doesn't help you in with what Susan and Ruth brought up is that if you're an adjacent landowner that has a drinking water well uh, in close proximity to one of these sites. But again, there's a lot of common sense approaches that we are just not um, enforcing and, and one being uh, our lined ponds that we have at these sites can easily be sort of a fiberglass swimming pool at very little cost to the industry. Um, we could do the same thing with regards to building a containment berm around the piping itself. Again, very low, low cost. And I think you did hit the nail on the head with regards to regulation. And, and, and actually, as Joe mentioned, the DEP is woefully understaffed in this nature. And Jerry has some very interesting data with regards to the sites that were inspected um, roughly on average, 10% have shown violations with regards to improper well casing and also the leaking lined pits. So if you actually increase that enforcement, um, you could probably at least m help to minimize some of these impacts. They're not obviously all going to go away, but we can do this in a much smarter fashion. So. Yeah, and at I, low cost. <laughs> and and I, just, I just want to emphasize that one of the things that I think people sort of don't acknowledge about this issue is that the gas isn't going anywhere. You know, we, we have plenty of time to, to set up a, an appropriate set of regulations, do the proper types of testing that it would take to know what the impacts of doing fracking um, in some of these areas actually are and how they affect watersheds, you know, hundreds or even thousands of miles away. But but we are, there is such a rush to make money off of the, the gas now and, and get the economic impact or, or, you know, um, positives out of it at the moment that, that many of those, that smarter thinking is pushed aside for, for the sake of making money now. So it, it's important to remember that, you know, we could take a, a good, long, hard look at this issue if, if we had the will to do it. And by the will, I mean the, the public opinion will and the political will. So what, I think a lot of what Roberta was talking about is really important to, to keep the pressure on elected officials who are um, in office at the moment. And yes, call them, call them, write them. I mean, we just delivered a thousand letters to the Department of Environment, Environmental Protection last week about the water testing issue. Um, and and it, it's important to, to do things like that. And we collected the letters from people at the door and it, the letters are really powerful. Um, so there's, there is a lot that we can do, but, but those who argue that going after natural gas is really important for the economy and, and for, our, for our energy interests are, in my opinion, and certainly in the opinion of Clean Water Action, are, um, you know, those, those are unfounded um, ways of looking at the issue. I'm curious about, um, Jerry, what you're saying with regard to um, the different densities and I'm wondering about the degree to which confounding variables are at play here, and that is variation in the practice of drilling. Um, and you know, I, I could certainly envision, although I don't know if it's a fact, but I can envision that even in a low density, one big mistake can have a huge impact. So, and you just mentioned the 10% um, non-compliance in terms of of those inspected. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that first part of what I said, but then also what percentage, I mean, it just seems like there is a, a void in terms of some of the regulations and oversight in this state that I think is playing a huge role here. Well, that's why we've, in our larger study that's built off the pilot study, we've broken it down into private lands versus public lands, because there is a very different oversight game going there. One private lands, very little oversight. In fact, I think many of the landowners that are approached, they don't even know things like putting protective linings around well casings to do some simple protective measures. And 
and that's the case in the Dimmick area where we saw big impacts. But public lands, meeting with those managers, there's lots of oversight. They go beyond what is on paper required to happen and they negotiate. I've met with these managers. So it's a very different play there. In terms of how these things translate to impacts, I guess we really don't know, you know, in terms, but it's certainly different when you have oversight in public lands and not much happening in private. Um, so we tried to control for that. And, and I'd have to say that even if there is variability in terms of risk per well pad, you increase the intensity, the number of well pads in a region, you're going to magnify your odds of a disaster or how many you'll get in that region. So I think that's kind of overrides a little bit of this variability and oversight density just to increase the odds of problems. Can you give us a sense of what, I may have missed this, but what percentage of the well, say in Pennsylvania, are on private versus public? And then secondly, given the fact that they're a little bit looser on private, do they tend to be denser? Oh, oh yeah. There's, in terms of public versus private, the number of well pads per unit area is much less in public zones. And they tend to increase the number of wells on a pad in the public zone to compensate for that. Private lands, I mean, even the placement of pads. You look at uh, public lands, they put a lot of these well pads near ridge tops, well away from streams. These people are doing really good work. The managers there, the forest managers dealing with the companies and they're cooperating. It's in their interest to cooperate because they don't have to fight as much with a forest manager if they play good with them. Private lands, you see the well pads. I see them down in areas working right along those borders or distances that they set. And, the densities are higher in pads, and they usually put maybe one well per pad because they're trying to get in there and keep their lease. So it's a very different game just at the public versus private land approach. Like what percentage of the total number of wells are private? Do you have any sense? I mean, basically. Vast majority. Yeah, it's, Vast majority. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it's, it's a huge number. I wouldn't be able to give you an actual Yeah, but, but like like 75, 25 percent kind of thing? I, I wouldn't want to speculate on what the actual percentage is. Yeah. But. What's the, uh, Susan, thinking about sort of on the ground reporting, uh, obviously tempers are, are sort of high on either side of this issue, or, or certainly can be. Do you have a sense of, um, you know, in, in areas where there's a fair amount of, uh, of natural gas extraction activity right now, is there a, is this leaning one way or the other more recently, or, or is it still still pretty divided? It's still pretty divided. Yeah, I mean, it's divided towns. People don't talk to each other anymore. And it's mm -hmm. best friends and families don't talk to each other because they're on opposite sides of the issue. Some very pro, some very anti. Yeah. And so as the impacts have, have come a little bit more to light, there hasn't been a big shift sort of seeing this as a, as a negative? Uh, not that I've seen. I mean, it's pretty much, yeah, I mean, if you're impacted directly, obviously you see it as a negative. Um, but if you're impacted in a positive way, obviously you see it as a positive. It, you know, it comes down to money, you know. Um, you know, like Kim said, she, she doesn't have a lot of money, nor does she have a lease. I mean, she just, you know, not everybody has a lease. Sure. Well, and they're clearly the, the biggest losers in this equation. Sure, they don't have a lease and somehow they their water has been impacted or their lifestyle has been impacted, then yeah. Just a quick question, um, excuse me, I guess um, natural gas is about eight times worse than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. Um, I've heard that less than 50% of it gets captured, which means that the environmental footprint of that would be essentially eight times what oil or coal or another industry would be on the atmosphere because it gets released. So, um, do you know any information as to what percent of the natural gas actually does get captured? It's, it's still 
beginning stages of trying to determine what that, that amount is. Um, Amanda Granis in our Department of Chemistry here, I believe, is working on that issue. So, yeah, I, again, as I mentioned earlier, you do have CO2 savings as a society if you switch to a greater usage of natural gas, but I think in the end, it might be whatever benefits there are might be well negated, if not surpassed by the amount of methane that is released into the atmosphere as part of the extraction process. But I don't, I haven't seen any reliable estimates with regards to what it is we are actually putting into the atmosphere with regards to methane through, through these leaks. And, so. and losing half sounds very high. It's yeah. Not, yeah. not nearly yeah. that much. There, there okay. is a study, mm -hmm. Howard has a study about the methane leaks. But, but the, the point is, you're right, it doesn't take a whole lot of that methane leaking out because it's such a potent greenhouse gas. One thing that's not been mentioned is pipelines, which are coming through the Commonwealth, and 2 to 10 percent is the estimate of natural gas that's being leaked through our infrastructure, which is faulty and not getting better with age. Yes? And then we've talked about, like, chemical impacts and, like, health and stuff like that. Are there any kind of, like, impacts of, like, just blasting the rock out of the way? Like, is there, like, would that cause, like, earthquakes or... Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. There have there have certainly been um, some some difficult to explain earthquakes uh, recently in in areas where there have been um, natural gas drilling. Uh, you know, in Ohio, um, there have been some some earthquakes that are certainly large enough to cause some some damage. Um, and it's you know not necessarily in areas where there are usually earthquakes. So you know, uh, once again, I wouldn't want to say that there's absolutely conclusive evidence that the earthquakes that fracking is causing earthquakes but it's there, there it, actually it's, is okay actually. all right yeah, there you go. In, in the <laughs> dallas fort worth area okay, um yeah, sure. there's like a ra there's been a rash of earthquakes and they've absolutely been linked to the increase in fracking and the the earthquake in ohio um on new year's eve uh was linked it, it was a direct result as a, of a deep injection well deep injection wells um, are used to dispose of fracking waste. Um, and so, whereas when you frack a natural gas well, I mean, the fracking process takes maybe, I don't know, a week to 10 days. But if you think about a deep injection well where they're disposing of the waste, it's basically the same high pressure is, is happening constantly, you know, like 24 7 if that well is in operation. Um, and if it, it, the, the chemicals they use basically soap, right? So it makes it, that's why it's called slick water uh, hydraulic fracturing. They want to make the, the water slick um, for, for a number of reasons, but when it gets disposed of, what happens is if that goes into a fault line, and nobody knows where fault lines are until the earthquake actually happens. So, you know, they're discovering these unknown fault lines places in, in Ohio with the deep injection well, but also in um, the Dallas-Fort Worth area with actual fracking. There's animals affected by the blasting, too. I know the Forest Service managers try to look out for snake dens and stuff like that. So that's another physical mm -hmm. impact. Um, I'm fairly sure I know the answer to this question, but I just thought I'd bring it up anyway. Since it's becoming a multiple state issue. Uh, as mentioned three now and New York is debating this constantly. Is there any possibility this will be brought up to the federal level? And there is a there is a federal EPA study happening right now. Um, one of the issues surrounding natural gas is the exemptions from a number of federal uh, environmental laws. Um, so it, it, yes, I mean, it, it's definitely on the federal radar, but, but how much um, oversight federal regulators have is, is, is pretty limited. I, I think everyone's sort of waiting for this EPA study to determine. I think it's a very, it's a very specific study. It, it, it's only focusing on, on water impacts, um, drinking water impacts. But it's going to be a while, at least a couple of years, before it's done. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering if, I, I didn't hear any comment about this, but I'm wondering if anyone on the panel is aware that in August of 2011, the U.S. Geological Survey 
uh, found that the Marcellus shale gas deposits are about 20% of what industry and the Department of Energy have previously estimated, um, and the impact that that has on long-term return on investment. Um, in the early years, apparently there's not a huge drop-off because you're still harvesting lots, lots of new natural gas. Um, but in the later years, there's kind of you know, drooping tail effect on the graph of return on investment where it becomes much harder to make money if you're an investor, if you're the state, if you're a municipality, if you're a farmer using your land. Um, and in most areas, whether it's Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, uh, Tennessee, in the, at least in the Appalachian region, um, it's a lot easier to make money over a 10 to 20 year period from wind and sun, even though Pennsylvania is not, you know, the tropics, than it is from natural gas. Um, are any of you aware of that discussion or how it's impacting Pennsylvania's policy makers? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm aware of the study and, and there has been, you know, a lot of controversy around just how much natural gas is recoverable. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to measure how much gas is in the ground. There's, you know, what you think it is, there's what you know, there's what you know you can get of what you know. I mean, there's all different kinds of terms and it kind of gets confusing for people who aren't in the industry to sort through the different estimates. Um, but how is it relating to policy? I mean, I think, you know, policy, as far as I can tell, on the state level, um, like, I'm sorry, what's your yeah. name? Joe said, it's all about money. I mean, you know, I, I, if you look at, you know, we did a story recently um, about Governor Corbett, you know, he took this junket somewhere with some guy who he had never been friends with before, but suddenly they're best friends, and this is uh, Moran Industries, it was in the waste disposal business, and Moran took Corbett and his wife in his private helicopter, you know, some island, a, a Long Beach Island or somewhere in Long Island. I can't remember where. Anyway, I mean, that kind of stuff happens all the time. And, you know, Corbett just went to, to Brazil, um, you know, and came back with, you know, a big, you know, announcement about, oh, there's all these Brazilian companies that are going to be, you know, investing in, in Pennsylvania. But at the same time, about a week ago, um, the company who was planning to build the Commonwealth Pipeline from, what was it, like Homing right. County? Yes. Like Homing County down through to Chester County just canceled it. I mean, why did they cancel it? Money. There's not enough money. They're, they they decided that either the price isn't high enough or their volume isn't going to be high enough or it's not going to last long. Who, who knows? But that's, you know. So just a clarification, you say it's about money. I think we always hear that when we talk about any kind of carbon-based fuel. People dive into it because it's about money. But are you, are you sort of saying it's about short-term gain for a narrow, you know, subset Well, I mean, that's for you to benefit. determine. I can't, I mean, I just gave you evidence of, of take it what, how, however you want. But it seems to me that, you know, if you're canceling the Commonwealth pipeline, that's, that tells you something. I mean, at the same time, is there a lot of gas there? Sure. I mean, the sweet spot in um, Susquehanna County is, I mean, when you look at what Cabot's recent report was, their annual report, or maybe it was their quarterly report, I can't remember, but they were getting a hell of a lot more gas out of there than they even themselves expected. So there are places in the state where you know, there's a lot of gas to be extracted. How long that will last and where, you know, it's, it's going to, when the drop off is going to occur, I don't know. I'm not, you know, I'm not a geologist. It's probably sooner rather than later for some parts and later rather than sooner for other parts. But for instance, in the Loyal Sox State Forest, um, Seneca Resources has a number of um, drilling sites there. They're doing really well, you know. Um, and the, you, you, recent, you, recently you also heard how um, a lot of the gas drillers were moving west to Ohio where there was wet gas, um, which is more lucrative than the dry gas. Um, but then you also hear recently there was a big report about the Utica Shale. It's not gonna be as big as we thought it would be. So you, you're constantly getting contradictory information based on whoever decides to study something. Um, and you 
really got to dig down when you're when you look at those studies and look at what they're actually measuring. You know, are they measuring, you know, um, just unproven reserves, or are they measuring what they know they can get out of the shale? And, and again, it's it's again, it's the, the devil's in the details. You can't just like say, oh, the study says this, the study says that. You really have to look and see, well, what did they look at? You know, what what actually are they measuring? You know, I, I mean, like 50% is leaking out into the air. I mean, that's ridiculous. I never heard of that. I, I, who said that? I, you know, I, why would a gas company allow 50% of their natural gas to just go out into the atmosphere? I don't know. Maybe that's happening, but. That's the first I've ever heard of that. And I, you know, you can't just throw things out there without, you know, having the data and and some evidence to say what you're saying. I mean, if if like I, I mean, when he says DEPs found 10% violations, okay, that that's measurable. Okay, you DEP, DEP did those inspections and they have that data. And if you believe the DEP's data, then that's measurable and that's something you can say. But you know, you really have to be careful about just throwing out like confetti what anyone says. You know about. I, this. I don't think the U.S. Geological Survey does that. But I think no, I'm not it, talking about the U.S. Geological yeah. Survey. But what did the U.S. Geological Survey actually say in their report? Like, what were they actually measuring? And I agree with you. I mean, the the USGS totally cut the amount of gas that had originally been estimated in their study, but it's still a hell of a lot of gas. You have to be careful. The Howarth paper that's always cited for greenhouse gas emissions, you read that right up front, Howarth says a lot of these things are estimates from other studies. They did as best they could to s assemble with what they know from lots of literature values, and people quickly jump on and say, oh, yeah, they, they measured this. No. He did the best he could to cook up an estimate, and that's about it. Sure. And, and I think it's important to remember that whether we have 20 years of good quality natural gas industry, um, sustainable economic, uh, you know, available gas left, or whether we have, you know, 400 years or, or something in between, it's going to run out and it's, it's not sustainable. So ultimately, we do need to really shift our focus in terms of energy policy towards what we know to be renewable and what, you know, the, the sun will, will not burn out before we run out of natural gas, and wind is not going to stop blowing before we run out of natural gas. So we should be investing in, in better technologies and instead of shifting our political focus, as, as has been happening, towards making it possible and easier to extract natural gas. And that said, though, there is always going to be environmental impact yeah. to every energy extraction. I mean, Right now, the way we get solar, we have to, you know, mine rare earths, and, and that's a really, really horrible, dirty process. Um, and so the conversation, which doesn't seem to be happening, which needs to happen, I think, on a local as well as a grassroots level, is, you know, what is our energy plan? You know, what do we want to do? What do we have, and how are we going to move forward, and, and what's the plan? Right now, there's pretty much no plan. You know, Obama says, oh, all of the above, <laughs> okay. You know, but it's, it's, not, it's not, as far as I can tell, a very thoughtful conversation. All right, so it's a little after 10. I think we'll, we'll stop the conversation there, although it, um, we, can, we can keep going for, for hours. And I think one of the things we've highlighted is there's still a lot that we don't know, so we can come back um, year after year for the next couple decades and have the same conversation. Um, definitely want to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to join us. Thank you very much. If you have some burning questions, they may be here for, for a couple minutes and, and you could uh, try to... Uh